All right, we're live. This is it. Boss number 25. 25 and live. Matt the Lee. Buffer Overflow Show. Keeping it show. real. And Joey Kelly. Martin. Back from Mexico. Going on a phenomenal trip. And we're going to tell you all about it. Shall we? We shall. You're listening to the Buffer Overflow Show. Do it live! Good evening and welcome to episode 25 of the Buffer Overflow Show, uh, recorded on August 23rd, 2012. A C E. What's A C E mean? After Common Era. Ah. The thing you see, A D is Auto Domini, which is Latin for after in the death. Nope, in the year of our Lord. Or after death. Nope. It's the, the, the it's the Latin it means in the year of our Lord. So the problem is, is that not everybody has the same Lord. So <laughs> they changed it to A C E after Different. Common Era. Do different lords have different years or what? Well, no, just I don't think it was, you know, fair I, for all of Christianity to push its name out on everybody. That's a good point. No, I fully so, agree. And then I think somebody figured out that having to rechange all the all the initials was a bad idea too. So then well. they changed AD to stand for something else and I don't know if it's what it is, if it's Auto detect dysfunction, or I don't know. I can see that. I can see that. So we yeah. should mention you can watch this live as we do these shows, all of our podcasts on our live TV pages on their respective sites. This one is bufferoverflowshow.com slash live. So join us. We have the chat room up. Just hanging out. Just hanging out. Yeah, every other Thursday. Um, watch for our Twitter or a post on Facebook uh, about our uh, uh, what's time we're going to start. Usually between 8 and 9 p.m. Usually, but we're a little early tonight. That's right. I got off early today. I got all my stuff done today. There we go. All right. So when we last spoke, I was on my way to Mexico. Oh, hold, hold on. Hold on. Allow me. Yes. Previously on the Buffer Overflow Show, Matt took a small medical vacation. The rest of us twiddled our thumbs for a week and a half while waiting for his monumental return. Now, he has returned from the land of tequila to the land of mountains. It is a quite different world down there. Like, I've been to Mexico before, but it was Cozumel, and it was on a cruise. And yeah, it's not the same. Well, it is because me and my buddy just rented scooters and went off on our own and ended up in some parts of town where, like, the, the essays on the corner were like, go, <laughs> you're not, like, this isn't anywhere you should be. You and, don't belong here, gringo, man. Basically, basically but in, in Spanish, uh, obviously. But so, but that, I don't know. Cancun is, for how luxurious people, like, think of, like, the resorts and everything, there is some ghetto in Cancun. Like, the rest of Cancun, it's a lot of rubble and, like, overgrowth growing out of the rubble. Like, it looks like a war went through there. I, I don't know. Maybe they haven't... They did. Maybe they haven't cleaned up since... When was the last Mexican war? I mean, I don't know. Besides but, the drug war that's constantly yeah. raging. And this is, this is, like, you know, Cancun is up here, and then 120 miles across the ocean is Cuba... And then, like, Ciudad Juarez, where all the drug wars, like, on the other side of Mexico, really. But right. You, I didn't, you didn't see any of that there. It was just a lot of just rubble. I, I don't know. Well, it, it seemed weird. I, I've been told, and I, and I can't say this with any kind of personal experience because I have never been south of, well, I've been to Florida, but <laughs> once. Oh. Uh, no, no, I've been to Florida once, but that was via uh, plane. But that's, that's the furthest south I've ever been. Um, but I, I have been told that Mexico is a country where you have, oh, and the hangout just froze. That. 
Okay. No, that's is, fine. I is mean, is that a new record for hangout killing? No, I think we killed it like ten seconds into a show once. I oh, am. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It just like refreshed and was like, okay. Well, I, what I knew, I knew your video froze, and I was like, oh, there he goes. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, so what? What I was saying was that I have been told I've never seen this myself that Mexico is a country with basically two classes. You're rich or you're poor. There's nothing in the middle. Yeah, I could see that because, like, we went we went to a lot. Like when you when you first get to the airport, there it's I don't know. It's it looks like a shopping mall, which is weird because you have the duty free really? stuff and everything, and then you got to go through customs and all that. But the guy like picks you up, and I don't know. Like I didn't know what to expect on the last episode. Like I was just. Re- We had some comments on the last episode on Boss 24 about a lady that went to the Rosarito one and apparently got taken for a ride, as they say. Uh-oh. Yeah. Did, did you see that? I, I didn't notice that one. I did notice a couple of comments on the Facebook page wishing you very well and good luck. Um, yeah, go, go look. That was Lori, my coworker. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah this... <laughs> It's some uh, somebody named Sunshine. First, they said, uh, I tried Ibogaine two times. Waste of money if you go to the wrong center. I tried transitions in Rosarito, Mexico, run by a con artist named Bo Mason. They administered cheap Ibogaine. I was in withdrawal for 10 days. Ah, oh, I would have killed myself. This guy is a thief and dope fiend. It's run by maggots. I got lucky. I found a legit location and got better. This detox works. And then someone named Melina wrote, I tried Ibogaine to get off Suboxone, which is what I was on, uh, but had pause, the post-acute withdrawal syndrome, for five to six months, relapsed back on methadone. In fact, did Ibogaine twice. Don't think it does great for buprenorphine users, granted. And then somebody named Iboga, (laughs) as in the Iboga plant, said, duh, you need to be off at least 14 days or it doesn't work. And that's what the doctors there told me. That's why they switched me to morphine so I didn't have to take the suboxone because, yeah, it apparently doesn't work. And I think we, we mentioned this before. Like, if you get put on suboxone and you are on methadone, if, if anybody knows what I'm talking about here, that like they make you wait until the methadone is out of your system because those two don't work well together. So it's... It's a very it's it's hard because like everybody's brain is so different and it was weird seeing a lot of most of the people that were there like we all had the same story we just came from some kid was from New York some kid was from the OC in in California some I mean they were from all over the place but they all had like the same story and it was mostly males we only saw one girl in there like the whole time I was there and I, I asked the doctor, like, how does this, is this any different with a female brain as opposed to a male brain? Because you're, you're really hallucinating. And I mean, we can talk about the trip itself, but I think on the last episode I mentioned I was a pretty avid hallucinator and familiar with the art of hallucinating. It, this, dude, this is like its own, <laughs> its own plane of existence. It, it's so intense and it lasts so long. Like, hour 18 you're just like oh my god end this please like it's 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 insane it, i've i don't know man i've never just, tripped that hard in my life ever ever it ever it sounds like the that warning they give you at the end of the viagra ads it says if you have an erection lasting more yeah. than 4 hours consult the doctor yeah, so what like you're saying is hour, if you have a trip lasting more than 18 hours consult yeah, help you know like an 8 hour trip 10 12 hours and then you're coming down like that's totally fine like hour 18 19 20 you're like this is never going to end i got I, I don't i don't know man it's i'm still like i kind i feel okay but i'm still piecing reality together i still see like weird things out of the corner of my eye here and there and it, i don't know matt it's, i am not a hallucination uh, i am really here you are on the planet earth you're, you're a human, human being podcast. and you're very safe that's right it's okay i think that was the other weird thing about it so uh, i guess uh, from the beginning like you you get off the plane and there's a guy there with the ibogaine clinic thing with like you know the the sign that's like over here, guy doesn't speak any English at all. His name was Ricardo. Perfect. And Ricardo was a badass. I'll, I have to say, anything you needed, if you could 
uh, and we were lucky there was a kid there who spoke Spanish and English, so he was kind of our translator for until he left. Then we were kind of f. But then another kid came that also spoke Spanish, so we were once again good. But like anything you wanted, he he was on it. He he cooked. He did all the dishes. He did all the driving. He did like everything there. He was like the man. I, I think he's, I don't know. I, I don't know what his previous employment was, but he, he was like one of those, like, maybe because I didn't speak Spanish at all, but very quiet, but very, like, you could tell he would whoop some, you know, he would whoop some ass in a second if need be. Real strong, silent type, you know. <laughs> it's <laughs> ironic you say that. My, um, my would-be mother-in-law uh, has a friend who is from Mexico. Her brother's up here visiting uh, legally, by the way, if anyone's <laughs> questioning, uh, as far as I know. Sure. I didn't ask him for his papers, but I'm assuming that he's, he's, he's legal. That's kind uh, of rude to do. Like, hey, yeah. S.A., let me see your papers. Yeah, like, well, that only happens in Texas. I am from immigration. Give me your papers. Uh, no, um, but uh, anyway, and he, I know what you mean because he speaks very little English. I mean very little and what he does is broken and some slang and yeah. you, you know and and some things the i mean you could tell him i want you to to burp a duck <laughs> and he would repeat it and have no idea what he said no clue you're just repeating sounds at that point right and and not understand that you know i mean may, he might know duck i mean you know you know what i mean but right it, 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 it's it, it's a language barrier, and it's a big language barrier. But when he knows so little English, I know so little Spanish that there's, there really is a wall. Google and, Translate but, does work well, but the one thing I failed to realize is that you need a data connection. Otherwise, it doesn't work at all. And in Mexico, there's no Verizon in Mexico, man. So I was hopping from Wi-Fi. And that I posted something about this. I was doing as I was being driven around because you, you go – so he picks you up from the airport. And it's just quiet, like the whole time. He doesn't even try to talk, and you you get to figure this out. You know, the more time you spend there, uh, and they go take you to the hospital, and you meet the heart doctor, and he you know makes sure your heart's okay because what you're about to go through, like if you have a weak heart, you could die. Like that's basically that's the bottom line. If your heart sucks, you're gonna die through this trip, and then they take you back to the place finally, and it's yeah, it was a very weird. Like I'm in a weird place with uh, the doctor spoke English a little bit, but I don't know. Just being driven around and just getting off the plane and like being in this weird country, knowing that I'm about to go on this trip, like it. I don't know. It all kind of became very real. Like when we were talking about it on the show, it was just from what I was reading, and I nobody really explained like what the process was once you get off the plane and you get to the place and everything and. And so, you know, once once you get there, they make you really comfortable. Like, I wasn't sick the whole time I was there, unless it was from the food or the water. <laughs> but <laughs> did, it, did it feel like a? I mean, did it feel like a medical facility like we would think of as a medical facility? Was it clean? Was it? it you know, was it, it? It was three big, like two story house things, and you know how the Mexico uh, architecture is. It, it was it was cool. Stucco. I, yeah, <laughs> stucco and and adobe. <laughs> yeah. It's so terrible. Is that Adobe Reader or no? It's Adobe Flash. It, it's, it's Adobe Flash. It's, crash. Oh. it's getting exploited all the time. Anyway, yeah, I, and they they make you very comfortable there. Like I like I said, I wasn't sick at all. You know, dope sick or anything like that. Uh, I had to stay at a hotel the first night, and they put me up at the Marriott Courtyard, which I was a okay with. They gave me pills to take with me, like. I'll call you when you're supposed to take these. Like, I'm not just going to get there and go nuts. But the funny thing is, like, when I got there, I didn't. I was like, I'm here to get better. Doing all of these at once isn't going to help that at all. And, like, it hit me. I, I, I didn't. Like, I took them like I was – it was weird. It was the first time I think I've ever taken medication, like, as directed. You know, it was – it felt weird. It, it did. I'll be honest. It felt really weird. And then uh, they, they picked me up the next morning back to the clinic, and then I got a room there. And I put pictures up on uh, my Google+. Plus. There's an album called The, the Ibogaine 2012 Trip. Uh, so you can see what the place looks like. You can see the wildlife that was there. We had some pet iguanas uh, and some chickens. 
which I found it. That was like the first thing I saw when I got there was this chicken. There, it's a picture at night of this chicken sitting on this thing, and that just like me and my friend. That was what what junkies are called up here. They're chickens. They cluck. They balk. They like you know how chickens get when you throw feed and they just go crazy. Like that's what pill junkies do up here. And so seeing chickens at this rehab like totally blew my mind. I had to take a picture and send it to my buddy. I was like, dude, fuck, look. <laughs> it's so great. But the inside, like, well, the irony of this whole thing that keeps, I keep coming back to this in this little conversation. We, we, we're talking about your Ibogaine trip, and then I'm never sure if we're talking about the actual journey or if we're talking about the 14 hours under running flow. No, this, this is all, I, I wanted to start at the beginning, so if anybody else wants to go to this place, they know what to expect. Like, you get picked up by this dude who doesn't speak English and taken to this place that's in the freaking ghetto. The roads are all torn up. And like I said, just over the fence, there's rubble with plants growing out. Like, this isn't this is reality, not not the trip. So, uh, you're there for about three days, and they're giving you morphine just to keep you stable. And you know, you just meet people and talk and hang out. And then they give you your last dose at 2 a.m. And then at 9 a.m. you go in. And that's that's when it started getting a little crazy. Uh, Mexican nurses did not speak very much English at all. Uh, and they put an IV in. She tried the first time and, like, hit my bone or something because it, it sent this shock through my head. I was like, ow! Oh, sorry! Sorry! I was like, what did she do? And then she gives it to the other nurse. And it's like... <laughs> Just, I don't even know what she said, but she just like couldn't do it. And so she gave it, and then the other nurse put it in my other hand, and then that was fine. Oh. And th that, that during the trip made it weird. Like I've never tripped medically before, like I said. And being in a hospital bed, you're in there with one other person, and they're on the other side. In the middle is the, the heart monitor. Um, you have the thing on your finger, and then the, the pads on your body, the, right. the, the EKG or whatever. So you're keep, they're keeping a constant watch on your vitals. Yeah, like the nurses stayed in the room the whole time. Like I could, and it was weird because it, it started to become part of my trip, and it, I'll, I'll explain that a little more later. But she's like watching Mexican YouTube and like laughing, and I don't know if the laughing is in my head or uh, yeah. So that that was weird. And then one of them was like falling asleep, but you know they they did they checked on you all the time, did your blood pressure and all that because. No. They're trying to do research on this also. Like right. they couldn't Is there the, like a way they could pull you out of it if you started to like flatline no. or something? Oh, I mean they could bring you back to life, I'm sure, if you if you like had a heart attack or something from the We're, trip. Right. Well, I, I mean like if if all of a sudden the, it starts I don't think, to go bad. I don't think you can stop that trip. I I'm not aware of anything. I mean, can people stop like an LSD trip? Like I think they just put you in a room and help you wait it out, really. Like when people I freak know. out, I don't, do they give you stuff? Because I know on opiate, if you overdose on opiates, they can give you something and that'll flush it out and then you go, you get sick instantly, but at least you're not dead, you know. But I, with hallucinogens, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, that, I would think any, any kind of chemical, you should be able to counteract it, but the question is... is you would think, but the South think. African iboga plant chemical, I mean, like, can you counteract something like that? I don't know. Yeah, Could it's called bogoaba. Is there a way to counteract a DMT trip? Because that's, I mean, that's all made naturally in your brain. You're just flooding it with, with more than, yeah, than you get when you dream. Or, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out. Mm. But um, so so you're in there. They they do the IVs and stuff, and the doctor comes in, and you know, the day before you're signing all this stuff. You're basically saying that you knowingly came to Mexico to try, uh, how do they word it? Un un. It, like a, a, it's not a normal course of treatment. You're trying experimental treatment, and if something goes wrong, like we're not liable. You know, like basically just getting them out of any kind of liability if something does go wrong. Because of course, dealing with hallucinations and hallucinogens and things that make you hallucinate, it's different for everybody. So they don't know how you're gonna react. Like the girl that came in, we like every new person that came in, the first question was, have you ever tripped before? Like the group that was there before and then new people would come in, you know. So we all became friends and we would always ask. And the girl was like, no, I've never tripped before. I like to be in control. And like the whole group just lost it. Like you're, you're about to, you, 
there's no control here. You're about to go on the most intense trip of your life. And you, you can't. There's no control. Like, I thought the whole you, point was to was to trip on something like this. It is, but for her, see, she got into uh, some. She had to take the get detox and then go to court as soon as she got back to uh, Texas. Uh-huh. So certain people, like uh, this other kid that I was in there with, he had some law problems also. But it looks good that you go to treatment. So what he did was went there to get detox. So he was clean and no withdrawals and he wasn't sick. And then when he got back to the States, he did a 30-day inpatient thing. So that you, – because you can't really – I don't think you can really show the court that – or because he came from Massachusetts and they have a law there that says if you're having a drug problem, like if you go get treatment, they're not going to prosecute criminally. So that's how he got uh-huh. out of that. But he still, because it's not a recognized treatment in the U.S. at all, right. <laughs> he still had to do the 30 days in the U.S. to show that I also – First, I got clean, and if you don't accept that, I still did this thirty-day inpatient thing, and so that then they'd let him let him go. And he had that. I was kind of I felt bad for him. He got caught like two days before he left. He was just trying to get something so he wasn't sick on the plane, and like he was five hundred feet from his house, and an undercover cop jumped up behind him and like choked him so he couldn't swallow the the dope. And his dad came out and like saw this all happen. I don't know. I felt so bad for him. Just because I've I've been lucky not to not to have to deal with any of, of that, but yeah, some of the kids there like had no criminal issues at all, and then some kids like got in some trouble. The ones that it seemed like the ones that came from bigger cities were the ones that got in trouble because they weren't doing pharmaceuticals; they were doing heroin, and heroin kind of tends to come from, I guess, shadier people. I I don't know. It just seemed like they had the law problems, and and those of us from smaller places did not. Well, the thing about I, I, at, the, at the risk of sounding like I'm condoning it, which I'm not, the thing about uh, abusing a prescription medication is that at some point that medication is purchased legally. You right. Know? It comes from – it starts legally somewhere. Right. And that, that was always my whole thing is that if you get hooked on heroin, like from bag to bag, it's completely different. What you did last night could kill you today. But right. when you do – pills or medication like that you know this is 30 milligrams this is right. 60 like you know every single time you know what it is it just seemed safer i guess and i mean i i didn't die so i you know it must be i think safer's but, relative but well I, yeah safer in comparison to scoring heroin from junkie alley in new york city yeah. absolutely <laughs> Yes, that, that there's there's levels of safety, and I think we can also right. agree that there's levels of stupidity here. Sure, sure. I'm just gonna go out on a limb. No, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If if I would have known the repercussions of my actions when I was younger and what I was doing to my brain, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have. I definitely wouldn't have taken it. You know, 15 yeah. years down the road. Well, it, somebody once said, if you could see the repercussions of every action that you, well, yeah. uh, you know, we, we'd all be perfect. I mean, right. you know, uh, that's, just, yeah. Yeah. But so, and I am kind of curious, like, it was the most intense trip and it wasn't fun. Just like that one video said, the guy's like, this isn't fun. Like, you're going to go through, it's going to show you shit and then put your face in the shit and then rub it around and... And it, it's a lot to deal with. I'm curious if it's the same trip if you're not detoxing. Because it, it seemed really detox-focused, like the visions and what it was doing to my body. Like, I'm curious what, what the Ibogaine trip is like if you do it with the, the Bweedy Shaman in Costa Rica just for a spiritual third eye-opening kind of vision sort of thing and not for a I have to detox before I kill myself sort of thing. Because, I, I, I don't know, it, it seems like it worked a lot on, like, those particular issues. So, I, I don't know. I was really curious. My friend here wants to go hang out with the shaman and uh, and do it. He wants me to go with him. I told him I need at least a year before I do that again. Yeah. But so, he the doctor explains it as it's it's like watching a movie. You don't have to like the movie. You don't have to not like the movie. You just have to sit and watch it and get through it. And that, that's basically how he described it to everybody is that you're just – just sit back. Um, when you close your eyes, that's when you have the visions. And it – dude, they are so real. 
one kid was describing himself being, he actually wrote a, a long trip report that was pretty awesome, but he says he got teleported into his bloodstream where he met the Iboga spirit in the form of a purple amorphous blob, and he was scared until the spirit said, it's okay. And he says it was so real, like it, until you open your eyes, and then you're back in the room, but you're still hallucinating, the room's breathing and doing all that. But when you close your eyes, you you start dreaming. It, I don't know. It's hard to explain. I'm still like wrapping my mind around what I what I experienced there. Did, uh, did another you kid. See yourself in the past? Did you see events, or was it all just imagery? It was like I don't know. The best way to describe it is what the the Asian kid said. He said it was like a deck of cards, just going, you know, just it was so fast and so vivid. But like as soon as you I don't know, you like subconsciously are solving problems within your mind, but it's happening so quick. And then the last like six hours or eight hours of the trip is then you revisiting all of that and like making sure you've got it. But like the first 14 hours is just intense, peaking visual vision. Like you're in this other plane. I, I, I've never experienced anything like what I experienced in that hospital bed. And it he says it gives you ataxia, which is you can't really walk uh, drunk. When you get really drunk, you have ataxia and your arms shake, your hands shake. Uh, so going to the bathroom was really hard. I remember laying there, and he gives you the test dose, which is one cap capsule with this white powder in it that comes from India, apparently, <laughs> is where they process it all. Uh, and that's to make sure you don't have an allergic reaction to it. Like... Oh. Me, I'm allergic to penicillin and sulfur, so you know, you never know. It's a South African plant; you could be allergic to it. So, if they just straight dosed you, you know, that that could be bad. So then, uh, a, a half hour later, he comes in with four more of these big, big capsules, and I was in a room with a guy who was in there for cocaine and alcohol. So they had me, 15 year opiate guy, and then in this other bed, alcohol and cocaine guy. And this guy, he like. He had his first company and sold it when he was like 16, and then he invested wisely the, what he made. And so he's been you know, living the life, basically, and he thought, it's time to, to get clean before I drink myself to death, which was really cool. But uh, So I remember laying there and thinking that this was completely bunk, because usually a mushroom trip or an acid trip, half an hour after you take it, you start to feel it, and then an hour in, you really feel it. This it was absolutely nothing until about an hour and a half for me and then it there was no gradual incline it was like nothing 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 boom I can't feel my body all of the sudden I can't walk all of the sudden I can't talk all of the sudden it just hits you and then it's intense trip for the next 16 18 19 20 hours and then it drops you off and that's when you reflect on everything and you start in the daytime I remember it's a dark room because they want you to you know they have blindfolds and stuff if you'd like I should have done that but I remember every time somebody would open the door because there were nurses coming in and out bringing you know supplies and stuff and whatever the light was so intense and it it like went across the whole room like me hallucinating but going from dark to light like that and then the doctor comes in to check on you and I swear he was in like full and I know he wasn't because I've seen him normal in reality and he looked just like a normal doctor when he opened that door and I was like peeking and you hear this buzzing and it, it's all part of the the hallucination I saw like flames and horns and this shaman standing there that was the doctor just like looking at us and all I could do was like crack a smile and that was it. I like wanted to say something. I was like, because uh, he, he mentioned it beforehand. He's like, I, I always wonder what they see me as because everyone probably sees him as something different and he always comes in to check on, on the patients, obviously. So he was wondering. And so I told him after the trip was all done and I was like, you want to know what you look like to me? <laughs> Crazy. Shaman, staff, horns, fire, like just insane. And then he walks away, closes the door, everything goes black again. And there's lights flickering around just from the hallucinations. Um, the room breathes. I remember 
feeling literally like my body was being bounced like this off of the bed like I was floating there it really disconnects you from your body and I think that's how it prevents you from feeling the withdrawals because I remember I had it in my head what time I took my last morphine and it was at two and I was like I should be sick as a dog right now and I'm hallucinating I'm tripping and I have my eyes open I'm like kind of you know looking over everything my hand looks weird because there's an IV and it all taped up and like just a, a weird thing I was like I should feel really sick right now and I don't and then I, I, I was like I kinda have to pee and I tried to get up and I couldn't I was like whoa and then trying to like get the nurse to, like they help you out and you kind of hold on to them and they drag you into the bathroom you know it's i remembered like putting it off as long as i possibly could cuz i didn't want to i didn't want to try to walk again it was so weird i i don't i don't know how how to explain it it, it was so intensely weird and then i i remember looking around and just seeing all the medical stuff and that kept showing me weird visions of like human centipede stuff and it was like freaking me out so I would open my eyes and be back in the room and it would like try to creep its way in and the doctor said like don't watch any scary movies the night before don't read anything scary like go in there with a clean mind and I was playing you know uh, what's that the zombie shooter on my tablet the whole night oh, like I didn't great. nothing so I'm like I'm seeing this some of this pretty dark shit and it's starting to kind of scare me a little bit like I, I know I'm tripping I know like what the heck on. did you do that for you should have played solitaire I know I'm playing dead trigger and racing need for speed underground I don't know I just it didn't hit me that like how intense it was going to be I was going to be like yeah, yeah that's fine I, I'll keep it out of my mind no problem but like there's no control there it shows you whatever and I yeah. subconsciously or what but it's weird like you can't sleep there's this weird energy it gives you but when you close your eyes and go into these dreams these visions they're so real like it's almost like you're sleeping but you're dreaming but you're not it, I don't know if that it's so hard to explain like unless and I'm gonna get a few of the guys they all agreed to come on Skype and talk about their trips so we could all share like what what we went through uh, we'll probably do that on the hotbox or, or some other show uh, sometime soon but because everybody had like a totally different experience at one point I was link from Zelda like in my brain and I had you know how Zelda how on that one game you have the little thing that kinda tells you like the little fairy I had the Iboga Spirit Fairy showing me in my brain, like, and so real, like, brain in, in there, like, synopses and stuff, showing me which ones to cut with my little Link Zelda sword. <laughs> it was so crazy. And the, it feels like you're there for hours and hours, but it's like each, each vision is, like, so quick and in reality. And I don't know, dude, it, <laughs> I don't even know. It's so crazy. And intense, and if you're gonna do it, you should really be prepared. I, I think, but I haven't had anything, and I'm not really sick at night. I kind of go a little crazy sitting here, but I think I need to move. I think it's my house. House has a weird vibe now. I don't know. It feels weird. No, the house has always had a weird vibe. You're just noticing it. Right. That's probably what it is. I mean, I pretty I much think it's the poster behind you. I don't think so. I pretty much did stuff like in this house since I've lived here. So I think that's a lot of of what it has to do with. I feel like out of place now. Like I, sh yeah. I don't know. It, it's weird. Well, if, it, if it's if it's worth anything, uh, you seem, and maybe this is just me, but you seem like you're less twitchy than you used yeah. to be. It mellows you out. I'll tell you what. You go through a trip like that, and I mean, it's intense on your body also, like just physically because of what it's doing. It ta I mean, it takes a lot to get those kinds of drugs out of your system. Yeah. And then just the fact of like, just go lay in a hospital bed for 24 hours straight and get up once in a great while to use the bathroom, if that. just you just laying there. Like, that, I don't know. I noticed when I got back to work, like, I was feeling kind of weak. And, like, the yeah. water seemed a lot heavier than it did But when I left. But it, I, I just racked that up to, you know, Mexico water and, and being in a hospital bed for a day. Day and a night and a day. So, after the, the big vision... Right, uh, so the trip happens, and then you you try to sleep but you can't so you're just kind of going over everything you just saw and 
wondering why you feel okay because when when you come out of it like you're not tired or anything like I didn't sleep for three days after I came out of it I tried to lay down I was just not tired at all and even now I'm only sleeping like three hours a night now I just I can't go to sleep he said the ibogaine uh, metabolizes into noribogaine which then gets stored in your fatty tissues and stuff and he said depending on how much fat you have is how long it'll last he says it usually lasts for about 120 days so I don't I'm kind of hating that but uh, after that you you just kinda go outside and it's daytime again and you feel normal it's it's the weirdest thing it completely detoxes you from whatever your whatever your issue is and then like I saw an article on the wiki about treating treatment with ibogaine without the hallucinations and it seemed to me like you need to hallucinate to get the full benefit like the things that it shows you I don't think you could I think if if it was something that you could just go and take a couple capsules and get detox and not go through a 24-hour hallucination just detox like I don't think it would work as well because you would know like I can just go back there anytime and take this again and be fine but because you have to go through like you put in work you go through this intense mind effing just trip while you're getting detox and I think it's that and the fact that this plant detoxes you somehow it, it goes in your brain I think I think that has a lot to do with why they have such successful non relapse you know percentages and, and such like you don't want to go back through that again I don't ever want to go back through that again you know it's it's such an intense eye-opening humbling ego killing experience like I would do it again in lower dose and not detoxing if if I wanted to do it again. But 24 hours is just too long to... Like, I get what it was doing, and it, it's still probably doing it. I get kind of waves of, like, hot and cold, but they only last for, like, a minute, or waves of kind of feeling weird, but nothing compared to what I would be feeling like. You know, this is, what, day... 10 or 12 of not taking anything like I would be on the floor with a gun in my mouth you know like it hurts so bad and, and I mean in comparison like definitely take a 24 hour trip over intense DT withdrawals like that so after you finished talking about your experiences and whatnot, you got right on the plane no, I'd hung out for like three more days, went to the beach. I mean, there's pictures up there from the beach. Like, we just hung out. You smoke a lot because there's nothing else to really do there. Um, but everyone, it's weird. Like, before everyone went in, because they do two at a time and each day, depending on how full they are. And so there's there's a group there that went through it and knows what it's like. And there's a group there that just got there and doesn't know what it's like. And, like, you can totally see the difference in the two groups. And then once the first group actually goes in and does it and comes out clean, they're just like that second group now. They're, they're a little quieter, a little more mellow. They're humble. They're, their eyes have just been, like, touched by God. I mean, if, if, I could, if, if I may be so bold as an atheist to say there's something as God, it is in this plant, and it blows your mind, and it, it changes you. It definitely changes you, hopefully for the better. I, I mean, I can't, I don't know. So you're contemplating what's happened for three days. Yeah, basically. And While you're sitting there meeting new people and then talking to them about, you know, why they ended up there, what their drug was, this and that. And there's a pool there and, you know, you can, you just pretty much hang out and, like, let your body recoup. And then you're kind of supposed to do that for, like, another week once you get home. They say if you jump back into things the stresses will kind of trigger those thoughts which will make you maybe want to go get high but so far so good so you so you you get back here and you got back late what was it what monday night or something like that yeah monday night like midnight yeah red and eye took, literally took tuesday off was going to take the rest of the week off but then got called into work on wednesday and worked all day and all night, and that was no good. <laughs> but so, how you know, at the risk of sounding totally 
blase about it. How are you feeling? I mean, are you do, do you do you feel like the same person? Do you kind of? I feel different because I'm not. I feel relieved that I'm not. I don't have to rely on having these pills so that I'm not sick, so that I can function. Like that was. I mean, 15 years. Uh, that it's such an intense way to live, like day to day, not knowing, having to plan around that stuff. Like, if if am I not going to be able to get anything? Am I going to be sick? It, like, it's. It's a real physical illness. Like it makes you sick. You don't leave the house. You don't. I mean, it's it's hard to explain to someone that's never gone through it before. But anyone that's gone through it knows that pain. And it's like like I wrote on Google Plus. It's that Hellraiser. I am pain. Kind of pain. It just it hurts, and you know what'll stop it. And you'll do pretty much anything. I mean, it can get you know crazy. And especially the longer you drag it out for, the, the, the more intense that pain gets. And it just, that is just a huge relief that, like, I don't have to deal with that anymore, which is nice. But, like, I, I still feel out of place. Like, I need to move, I think, or something. I don't know. I still feel weird. But well, you are that, weird, so. Well, right. And is that expected? I mean, from a 24-hour trip like that, like, should I be feeling normal right now? I, I don't know. Like, I've I've never tripped that hard before. Like I said, I, I, I was not prepared for what that was like, and I thought I was. I thought I was going to have a cake of a time because, I shit, I've tripped all the time. That ain't nothing. Oh, no. It's uh-uh. something. Uh-uh. <laughs> it is something. This thing comes out from behind and beats your Oh, my ass. God. You have no idea. It, yeah. So intense. And for so long, you just lose track of time and reality. Until you have you're not, to... You're not sure what's real, what's not. Yeah, well, it's it's not that much because when you open your eyes, you're clearly back in the room, but you're still hallucinating. And when I say that, I mean, like, the room's breathing or you see the silk curtain effect. You're seeing tracers from your hands. You're seeing lights where there's no lights. But when you close your eyes, that's when you... It, it's like going through the rabbit hole. And that that's what my friends say. He's like, you know, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? How... How that's that was always the thing when we were kids when we were eating acid mushrooms. It was like how far, how deep do you want to go? Deep, eat a ten strip. Deep, eat twenty. Like this is it, this is its whole other level of like down the rabbit hole. This is like completely through it and then back again and then through it. it it's yeah, it's crazy. But so I know it's it, it's hard right. to tell. I know it's hard to tell because you've only been back a few days. But do do you feel the compulsion? to go after a, a, a trip again or are you is is it in your mind at all or is it in your mind and you're controlling it or to do drugs like do I have cravings or do I yeah. want to go hallucinate again I definitely don't want to go hallucinate again well no I mean like for instance my girlfriend quit smoking and she every once in a while she gets a really strong craving for a cigarette I was getting cravings today and I actually went to I shouldn't even say this. My mom's gonna listen and be so mad. I went to the pharmacy to try and buy a bag of darts needles. You can't anymore here because you need a prescription now. So I was like, awesome. And after that, like like I felt lost not having anything like that and just work. I was like, this is this is so stupid. Like what the f- what am I doing? And and like I just went and. The lady was like, oh, do you have a prescription? I was like, oh, no, do you need one now? She's like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. So the cravings are there, but I guess they're easily controlled now. I don't, I don't know. No. Counting down the days, I guess. Yeah. But I think I think more so, too, is what, what you get shown in, in the hallucinations is like, you know, you're this dirty, terrible person. F up that just ruined lives or you know it's and every trip's different I, I, I'm just giving you a, a hypothetical it's well it, you are dirty and you are and I, sorry. I absolutely am and it, it makes you think about it like it doesn't let you stop thinking about it so you you deal with a lot of that psychologically I guess but yeah I, I don't know it's Maybe because I I haven't slept very well and like I just want to sleep or maybe just I was getting high for so long I just want to get high I just I, like I had this wicked craving I was like all right 
let's see, can I just do it once and then not like touch it the rest of the week? Like I was gonna try and see what 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 would happen, but but I got stopped and I couldn't. So I was like, cool, that's good to know. So I don't know. I guess it's not a hundred percent miracle like everyone says it is. I mean, it's still at the end of the day, it comes down to you and are you gonna go get high or not? And now I know that I can't, so that's not even an option anymore. So I don't know if that makes sense. Like in in my brain before, it was like, well, I could if I went and got what I needed, and and fun. but now that I know I can't, like it's I don't know. It's more grounded now. I think if that makes sense, which is good for my sobriety. <laughs> I, I'm glad we can talk about this now. But yeah, it, interesting. I I'm glad I did it. I'm definitely I'm really glad I did it. Like I, in, I like you said, uh, do I feel normal? I feel achy sometimes, but in comparison, like I feel completely normal in comparison to what I would be feeling like. And the more I was reading, man, that suboxone stuff I was on, like you shouldn't be on that for years and years. That should be a quick taper and then nothing like they they're using it all wrong, and the, the, I heard that a lot down there. These kids were on it, not as long as I was, but like they were on it, and they were like, "Man, that it, it, it's not right." <laughs> like that, I don't know. It seems like doctors are just here. You can be on this the rest of your life, and it's okay. Like, no, dude, it's absolutely not okay. I mean, uh, well, the quote a, a mutual. I can't remember if this was a mutual friend of ours or if this was someone else, but. Uh, the comment was made, has he ever been, in his adult life, has he ever been not hooked on something? Yeah, and, that's that's another thing they say is that you revert back to the age you were when you started doing drugs. So, like, I'm 15 again. I, I don't know. if I don't know how true that holds for everybody. How, I can, how different is that? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> like, 15, 30, I mean, it's Man. a diff. Doing podcasts, talking crap, who cares? What was it? So I was it. One of the Foxworthy, I think, said, or no, Bill Ingvall, maybe. Every man stops maturing at age thirteen or something. <laughs> yeah. So you're Sorry. fine. Yeah. 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 It's only as smart as your shoe size. It's okay. Oof. But yeah, it's it's. I, I'm glad I did it. And in, in comparison to what I would be feeling now, or just continuing, like I just. It was so long. I just got to the point where I was so aggravated and frustrated. And like, just hated what I had to do to keep going to work and not being sick. Like it wears on you, and it was to the point where I just, I had to either do something or I was going to do something and just be done with it. And it, yeah. it, I don't know, man. It's, it's you hit weird. the mythical rock bottom. Is that what that's called? I've I've never known to. That's interesting. That's, that's, the, that's what they talk about when they when you when you talk about an alcoholic or, or any other addict that that they they get to the point where they are like you know what I no longer want to live like this. It and, becomes not fun. Like right, doing all this, the fun I'm, is gone. Exactly. I don't want to like sugarcoat it, but doing what I did was so fun. But it gets to a point, you know, years and years and years later, where it becomes necessity. And the second it becomes necessity, it becomes so not fun. Oh yeah, at yeah, all. at all. In you've the you've lost the, yeah. It's you st you started for fun, and then you, and then it sucked the fun totally out of it. Yeah, it it lost its its spark, if you will. Yeah. When when you don't have something and it makes you that sick, like that's not fun anymore. And I mean, it's different for everybody. Some people can go, you know, and do this stuff once in a while and be fine. Other people, they do it once and they have to do it every day for the rest of their life, you know. And I have one of those personalities. Apparently, like, yeah. if I'm gonna do it. I'm doing it, I'm doing it all. I'll worry about it tomorrow, and just living like that, you know, day to day. It's just, it's crappy. It's no good. So, do you feel like you're able to? make some different plans now for your life? Do you feel like you're able, to, like this is a turning point and from here things will be different? I don't different like how? Like I'm going to go back to school and get my degree in astro astronomy or something or? Well, no, but like you're you're going to start thinking not about tomorrow, but or not, not about today or what am I going to do today and tomorrow, but what am I going to do next week? What am I going to do the week after that? What am I going to do? I think that, like I've always kind of lived that way just kind of day to day. 
I, I think it was more so having to plan around if I was going to be sick or not. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm not, like, I, I don't know. It just, it's just that part of it I don't have to worry about, and I can just do what I want to do day to day. I don't have any, like, plans or anything. I mean, we live in Montana. Nobody really plans much up here. My mom wanted me to go back and take like some classes because I, I guess I'm I have a bunch of credits and I almost have a degree. I don't know, but I don't know. I don't know what that would do. Like I, I'm 31. Is it time to go back to school and be, well, be something? Like what what am I gonna be? You know, like well, what? For what it's worth, um, my girlfriend Paula is going back to school here about another week, a um, little more. And uh, she's going back for, let's see, she's been out of school for four or five years. And um, she's going back for something completely different. She uh, a doctor yet or what? No, um, she never finished the first degree. And uh, discovered she that switching? She, well, she, she discovered that she hated it. Hmm. and um, Better in school than in career, right? Correct. Very much so. Uh, it's nice to it's nice to be playing with the shovel in the sandbox to find out that you hate shoveling things than it is to yeah. be on the construction job and yeah digging uh, ditches and loving life exactly so um yeah yeah so she discovered she hated it and she spent four or five years thinking about what she wants to do working various jobs that were you know not careers their jobs. Fast food. Fast food? She worked fast food? She worked one fast food. She's not working at a fast food place currently. Um, but um, she worked one fast food, and that was awful. She got out of there. She's worked other places. She's, worked in, she's working in retail. Um, and it's, it's not what she wants to do for the rest of her life, and she knows that. And she's figured out what she wants to do. And so now we've set her up. For, okay, we're going back to school, or she's going back to school. And hopefully th- that realization is going to put her on a different track. Right. So that she actually can do something that she wants to do, and, and I think that that's a lot of a, a lot of people's problem that end up. No offense, in your situation, in their thirties, not in a career, really in a job, right? They're, not knowing what the hell they want to do, or yeah, not really I, caring what they want to do because they're getting by day to day, and that's good enough, right? Well, and then and that's the thing is is that that's not that's not good enough for some people, right? You know, it's not good enough for me. It's and definitely, the her. drugs like make that more acceptable. I would say, like, if if you meet other drug addicts, like they're more, they're more accepting of living lower standards or crappy or whatever. You know, than than normal people would be. Like, how are you living like this? And you're like, like what? I mean, this is normal. You know, yeah. it, it's a total different standard for sure. So I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of things I'd like to do. I'd like to get a pilot's license and fly. I like doing that. I mean, astronomy, physics, that stuff all interests me, but only to the point of reading the books and then understanding what I'm reading. Like I don't, I don't see it as something I'm going to do as a career. You know, it's more like citizen science, fun hobby stuff. But uh, who knows? I, well, I that's that's the other thing is that d- people get degrees for different reasons. They get degrees because they've started to get a degree. They get degrees because they think they have to have one. They get degrees because they want one. You know, and then they get and then there's other people like myself that get a degree from a trade school or what used to be a trade school. ITT and, tech. <laughs> no, no. Business accounting or no. hotel management. Yeah, <laughs> I love those commercials when I was a kid. Get your correspondence degree, folks. And, that's and, right. Yeah, and then yeah, you but, scroll um, through the list of all the crap that you could do. It's so yeah. good. Automotive mechanic. I'm like, oh my god, I can take a correspondence cor- in automotive mechanicing. I don't know how the flying heck they're gonna make me take a test on a motor, but I don't care. I'll have but to you mail it to them. You mock that until the day your car breaks down and it costs like two or three thousand dollars to fix. You're like, damn, I should have should have been a mechanic, you know? Curses. Curses again. <sighs> But yeah, I don't. I I have no idea. What what would you recommend for for myself here? What what should I do? Quit podcasting first and foremost. <laughs> well, I, I I think the the the, the things that you, you need to do uh, initially are you need to reevaluate your existence, which I think you're already doing. Um, I think yeah, you need. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right, way of, way ahead of me on that one. A lot of reexamining and reevaluating and just. Just taking everything. inventory, you know, like what? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think uh, 
I think what you should do, for one thing, um, we all know, if, if you're a little behind the scenes, FYI, for those that are uh, our recurring listeners, Matt does the production work, editing, and whatnot on the Jam Hole, which appears still twice a week, or are we done to once a week? No, nah, we just do that once a week. All right, once a week. Uh, the Hotbox Podcast, which... Which is a once a weeker, uh, yet another tech show, which is a once a weeker. They're all once a week now because there's five of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Attack of the Androids, uh, the Buffer Overflow show, which we've actually cut back to every other week so that Matt has a night off. Right. Um, that was and- back when I got a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so then when, when that uh, no longer happened, then he was like, well, we go back to weekly, and I'm like, ah, yeah. no, no. No, I have a girlfriend again, which is cool now. Oh, like, okay, well, never mind. I'm going to stick to the every other week format. Yeah, she <laughs> just wanted me to get better, uh, it turns out. Yeah, well, it's hard to I, – I, I heard the same thing, but it's hard to improve on perfection with this. I hear that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you hear that, but you don't agree with it. Yeah, no, I uh, hear that, and I usually edit it out, so it does. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't I don't know. Like I didn't start podcasting cuz I thought I was going to make money in a career doing it. It was just fun to do. It was fun to talk shit like the jam. Oh, yeah. We started that to make fun of stuff and talk about our lives and it ended up being a chronicle of dates I went on at the early year. Like it was just fun. And and then the hotbox got started because of obvious reasons. There's medical marijuana in this state and there was a lot of problems circulating. So we talked about that and and we, you know, went to these symposiums and these conferences and helped them stream live, and you know, we we had a lot to do with a lot of that, and that that was good because activist work is is good work usually. Yeah. And then the tech shows, I just love tech, and I don't know how we started three of them, but you know, Android. And I'm then, not really sure how the three started either. Um, because it was the, the Android show was first, because you know yeah. we love Android, and then and then yeah, it's because those old guys wanted to do a podcast, and they said. They wanted me to host it, <laughs> which I do like that. Like, it's so cool being able to talk to guys that were at those homebrew computer meetings back in yep. the day before I – like, that's cool to me, before I was born, you know. And then this show, like, I like doing this. It's, it's nothing that I'm like, man, if we don't start hitting our numbers, I'm going to start oh, yeah. canceling some shit. Yeah. Like, I don't care. It's, it's just something we do, but it's – yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not reevaluating like, which shows am I going to kill, you know. It's, it's well, just – I, I don't think it's bad but, to get uh, back and you know get get my brain wrapped around everything here. Well, what I think you need to avoid is the 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 type of of habits that would condone one to seek a stimulation of any sort. That's and, true. I was like Rush Limbaugh. Like that was ritual. I would get off yeah. work. I would go get my stuff. I would come back here. I would get high, and then we would podcast. And then after we would podcast, I would get high, and I would try and post the shows and stuff. Yep. Like since I've been podcasting, I've been doing that. And so it's this was nice. Like I didn't want to do shows yesterday for one, I, we went out to dinner with, with Amber, but I, I just, I didn't feel ready yet. I, I don't know. That sounds stupid. Like, you're not ready to talk. And it'll, like, like, shut up, Matt. But it, I just, I don't know. I still felt well, really out of No, I mean, this, this is the show that is the least stressful because it's the least number of people on it. It's me and um, you. And by now, 25 in, like, our editing is minimal. Right, because I finally stopped popping into hence the pop filter oh, got it, good. watching the video exactly. um you know and and, uh, and i've going, stopped you know, there's and unless hangouts crashes <laughs> but right. for the most part we keep the show going and it's yeah. getting to be like the jam hole like as soon as that show's done i clean up the audio which is two filters i run and then it's done and that's it like no editing it's what you hear live is the podcast Right, but the other two shows, like there, there is a lot more editing, and, and there, there's a lot more time I spend with them yep. to get them to where I am happy with it. You know, and if I figure if I'm if I'm not happy with it, then other listeners are definitely not going to be. But if I'm happy with what we've produced, then everyone's going to like it. And well, the the problem so the problem is, you you know, ultimately you're only one person, and right, you know, you need to have eight hours of sleep a night. Yeah, that's, you know, that never happens. I, I remember. Okay. I mean, fine, maybe you have at least six. Yeah, uh, but I, I'm saying I remember before I left, like on nights that we were doing shows and stuff, I wouldn't get to bed till like three or four because I'd want to, oh, yeah. 
get everything done and I yeah. couldn't sleep until it was done and I was right. you know getting high while I was doing right. it so it was fine and right I don't know I mean that, that's I'm what I'm getting sleeping, at I mean I'm not sleeping well now so now is probably the best time to to start you know getting shows banged out but yeah I don't know I mean we're, we're it was ritual to... right how how long does it take to break five years worth of ritual I mean that's that's habit. That's in, it's in your mind, and I mean, I I detox, so I'm not like sick from it. But there's still that that habitual ritual that I was doing that has to change now. Right. And, yeah. and one of the other things we got to evaluate, um, or that you have to evaluate, is how much of this work that you're doing can be either minimized, cut out completely, Delegate. or delegated. No. And, and the reason why I say that is that okay, let, let, let's take a let's take a page from um, the big boy in the podcasting network, Leo Laporte, uh, also known as the chief twit of the twit network at twit.tv. Free promo there, Leo. Um, says, yeah, speaking like I know the guy. Hey, Leo. Do you, think, yeah. do you think he writes all of his show notes like with Yats? Yeah. Aunt, me and Ant switch off writing show notes, but all the other shows I pretty much write the notes for. He he doesn't write any of the show notes. See if I, I can I don't just... even think any, I don't even think any of the Twit staffs write the show notes. They put it up on a wiki. Really? And they let the fans do it. Well, you can do that once you reach a certain amount of fan base. If we right. did that, there would be no notes. You know, let's, let's be honest. Exactly. So there's we're a, not there's that a... to that that critical mass uh, at all. But I don't know. I, I also like writing, but I feel like it would be if all I had to do was edit the audio and like do the production of the audio and left the WordPress crap to everybody else. That that would be way awesome. But I feel like too, they're my like I built those sites, and I I mean it's it's nothing special. They they all look the same. They're all the same site. So I with what works with one works with all of them. You know. But I feel like I have to make sure. I have to check it. I have to make sure that what's going up there is proofread and spelled yeah. correctly. I like I I don't want problems right. like that. And it's stupid. It's just dumb OCD stuff. But even when we were doing the groovy post thing, there was a post of mine that went up with a typo in the permalink, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" I was so mad about that. But once a per, I mean, you don't you can't change permalinks really unless you do redirect, and they were gonna do that and. It just that kind of stuff. Like it bugs me. If if you're gonna put something up, like make it make oh, it good. By the way, there's a T-shirt on badideatshirts.com that says, "I have CDO. It's like OCD, but with the letters in the proper order, as they should be. As they should be, alphabetically. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, you got any other questions? That's about an hour, and I need to go get steaks and go barbecue with my madre. All right. Well, first of all, give uh, our best to uh, your mother. Um, Should but, we mention the donate thing? Because they just went like seven or eight thousand dollars into debt to like give us these amazing trip stories that I've just relayed to you guys. So yes, please <laughs> hit up bufferoverflowshow dot com and hit that donate thing. Click on the donate button. Keep keep the show alive. Uh, I mean, we're, we're Matt and I. We're not getting rich off this. Uh, where there's we're no advertisement, getting... there's no you know sponsorship. But that's the thing. I don't want to go that route. I, I feel like every other podcast I listen to has ads, and I always hate them, and I always fast-forward them. And if we can even differentiate ourselves just a tiny bit by not having ads, like, I'm down. I don't yeah. want ads anywhere. Yep. But, but I also um, don't, didn't start this to monetize it anyway. So. Well, right. That's the other thing. you know. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think that everyone throughout the tech shows that I've talked to, and particularly – myself personally, we're all pulling for you. We all hope that this is a permanent change. This is a turning point in your life road where you now are headed in a, maybe not different, but a, a more healthy, a, a more healthy direction, a more healthy direction. Do I look um, more healthy? I, I'm uh, I got tan. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, you, you got some bags under the eyes, but that's a lack of sleeping thing. But, um, uh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. You do not have to get that close to the camera. That is just wrong. Nice HD shot there of like, my ah, droopy face. Coming at me. Oh. Uh, no, but I, I think that we're we're all pulling for you, and and I think that this is hopefully something that you look back on in five or ten years and go, you know what, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, and you were able to close the book 
on the on the addiction phase of your life and you're able to move on and decide what Matt Lee is about not Matt Lee plus substances are about right that was something one of the guys from Yats said uh, he says life is 10,000 joys and 10,000 miseries hang in there because they were they he, he mentioned he's like you know we're here for you we're pulling for you and I said I appreciate it this is the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my life and I, I'd never heard that before. Life is 10,000 joys and 10,000 miseries. Yeah. Hang in there. I thought that was pretty awesome. Wise words from the old men that we do that show with. They well, are wise. By the way, speaking of a specific, the other thing you could do would be to record the shows and proof them and publish them later. Yeah, I, I could. I, I mean, try I, and do I it. I try not to let them go more than a day. Like, if I don't get them posted that night, they're posted when I get off work the next day. Right. But I feel, I don't know, I feel like the the content gets stale, especially with the tech shows more than anything else, just because, like, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking about what's happening, like, right now. And if you hear it, you know, a couple days later, that's okay, but any more than that, and it's, it's old news. Like, I, I had to go through my Droid X through Beyond Pod and just, just wipe a bunch of old shows because I, the way I had it set up when I was at work, I have a certain amount of time I'm in the truck and right, I can right. get through a certain amount of shows. But because right, I wasn't, I was listening more to music when I was there, not podcasts. So I have this backlog. And if I start at the bottom and keep, like, I'll never catch up I, I, unless I take a weekend and, like, actually sit here. But it's all, it's tech news. It's all old news. So yeah. I've read about it, at, you know, when I was down there. I was still keeping up with stuff. I just wasn't listening yeah, yeah. to you actually so. tweeted a link to something that I was going to talk about on AOTA. Oh, yeah, the camera? Hmm. It's interesting. We'll talk about it next yeah. week on AOTA. If it's not old news and stale. Oh, I don't think so. That's that's crazy. <laughs> I think you want... It's like, I have a camera in my phone. You just put Android on your camera. <laughs> like, what the... Yeah, but this... The, okay, all right. Before I go oh, on a tirade, we'll, bring we'll it. save it for that show. <laughs> Fair enough. That just seems silly. The whole time I was in Mexico, you know what? I didn't touch my Sony Cybershot 7.2. You know what I was using? The old G Next. Always had it with me. Always had my other camera with me, but it was in my backpack. Never pulled it out <laughs> once. All those pictures that are on the album from Cancun, all taken with this thing. Yeah, okay, once again, difference between you and me. Just saying, I'm not I shooting I have a s website that says I'm a photographer. Oh, I use a hashtag that says Android Photography, <laughs> so. Yeah, okay, that's a little different. I get paid to do weddings. Yeah, well, I would uh, hope that if I paid a photographer, he didn't show up with his Galaxy Nexus. <laughs> I was like, no, it's Somebody's going to try it now that you've said that. I know, right? Just put it in party mode, and there's all the pictures. Look uh, Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, leave a message for the show if you'd like, 406-204-4687. If you are struggling with any kind of addiction and you need someone to talk to, I've been through it. I'll talk you through it. Just get a hold of us. We're online, on the Facebook, on the Twitter, Groovy Matt and San Peaver. And uh, <laughs> Facebook, of course, and Google+. Plus. I've been mostly there. I, I want to mention, in closing... As we were driving around Mexico, everything is WEP down there. There's no WPAPSK. I everything was WEP. I, I made a Google Plus post about it, talking about it. If you want to go read it, but Easily just to, correct. It seemed weird. I wish I had my netbook with me. I was like, I don't have backtrack. Ah, I can't crack these. Uh, it just it seemed weird, like watching them pop up and they're just WEP, 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 open, 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 WEP, open, open, WEP. And they're all like by the same company, this Infinitum or Infinitum or whatever. Huh. And I kept having to reboot that damn thing. The one they had one at the at the clinic, and it just dropped connection all the time. <laughs> Such annoying. I I will drive in this. And it wasn't even made in Mexico. I don't know. Weird. I'll put links to the picture album and uh, some some thoughts if you'd like on the Buffer Overflow Show site. All right. So once again, Matt, uh, we wish you well. Uh, stay strong, my brother. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Counting right. the days. Counting the okay. days. And we'll see you all on Buffer Overflow Show, episode number 26, which should be uh, a week. week off next week and week on the week after. 
Yeah, because we're off schedule now. We should have done a show last no, Thursday or next Thursday. No, no, we aren't. Didn't we switch? Because I didn't see it in my calendar. I have it the other every other week, and this uh, wasn't the week. Yeah, but didn't we? We may have switched. I'm sure we did, but I maybe I just didn't change it in my calendar. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're on track because uh, the 24th was posted on the 9th. Yeah, 24 uh, was on the 9th. And then skip the 16th okay, and so we're recording are. on the 23rd. So, no, we're, well, we timed this perfectly. Um, Next show will be September 6th. Yep. And so assuming that everything sticks and we don't have some weirdness issue come up. That's right. I don't have to go back down to Mexico. No, right. I'm totally kidding. Mom, I'm totally kidding. I'm I'm fine now. I just needed to talk to Joey. Now I'm yeah. fine. <laughs> See, Mom, I am the friend that you wanted him to have. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, email show at bufferoverflowshow.com, or is it info? I forget. Info. You can find it online. Check out the site, bufferoverflowshow.com. Joey, thanks for Matt. easing me back into this podcast game. I'm, I'm here. Great. I'm easy like a Sunday morning. That's right. Easy breezy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Cover girl. Because <laughs> you're worth it. All right. Peace out, guys.